Greetings everybody and welcome to the latest episode of the RISC 4.0 video blog series. In this episode we aim to discuss the law of regression to the tail and how it influences risk. Now just as a quick recap, the reason that I started this blog was because at the heart of the 2020 coronavirus phenomenon, I noticed that a number of advanced risk management concepts were coming to the surface which when collectively put together potentially represented uh, the new age curriculum of the modern day risk management profession. So with these knowledge areas in mind, I've started a blog where we can actually start talking a little bit more about some of these concepts. Now, this particular episode looks at a very unique statistical concept known as regression to the tail. And what it basically states is that some known risks are only getting bigger, more momentous, and more disruptive every generation. So if we don't learn to effectively control them now, it's not going to get any easier for us in the future. Now, before we proceed into the detail, it's important to me that uh, people don't think that I'm just making this stuff up or I'm coming up with it on the fly. The fact is I'm actually drawing from recognized academic research uh, and experts in the field. So today we're drawing from the collective expertise of two well-known risk experts, uh, Ben Flyberg and Nassim Taylor, who should be no strangers to those of you who've been in the risk management profession for a while. Both have published extensively on today's topic and this presentation uh, draws strongly from their collective research. So, in order to get into the detail, I think it's important that we just do a quick refresh of first year statistics just so that we're all on the same page about what we're talking about when we discuss the concepts like regression to the tail and regression to the mean. So, for those of you who remember your first year statistics, this is a standard distribution curve, aka bell curve. And basically what it does is it's a means for demonstrating the distribution of a set of sample results across a particular value range. So, for example, if we were to measure the height of all the individuals on this planet, uh, on our x-axis down there, we could probably have our height range, we'd go from roughly 3 feet to 7 feet. And on the y-axis, we would have our sample population of 7.5 billion people and the number of people that would correlate to each height range. Now, of particular interest on this curve are some of the limits that we can notice. So, for example, um, what this will tell us is that the average height or the mean is roughly 5.6 feet, uh, sorry, 5.6 foot, and we have an upper and a lower limit um, known as the upper tail, which is typically your tallest 20% of the population, and your lower tail, which is the shortest 20% of the population. And that's probably the key concepts that we probably need to be aware of when we talk about distributions and regressions today. So the next question probably comes, well, what's a regression? And, and mo many of you remember that that's a behavioral relationship or a statistical trend. So in the case of regression to the mean, what we're actually saying is that the more case samples that we throw into our sample population, the more the, tr the results will trend towards the average. Equally, Regression to the tail says that the more samples we throw into the total population, the more the results will trend towards the outer limits or the extreme. So that is the fundamental difference between regression to the mean and regression to the tail. Now, before we can get into regression to the tail, it's probably best we talk about regression to the mean. And in this particular case, we'll actually talk about how it impacts on risk as well. So in order to demonstrate regression to the mean, a very popular experiment that exists is the Galton board experiment, which basically shows how multiple random events trend towards a mean. Now, the way this experiment works is fairly simple. What you have at the top here is a reservoir filled with an unlimited number of uh, little metal pellets. These pellets are then released into sort of a, a filtering section where they bounce around randomly, possibly even chaotically, until they gravitate towards the bottom, and then they settle in a particular tube or lane, and they find their, their home. Now, the really cool thing about this experiment is, is that it doesn't matter how many times you do it or how many balls you use, they will always form this typical bell curve shape. And that is what regression to the mean is. It's, it's a statistical phenomenon which occurs when the most extreme case outcomes are inevitably balanced out by multiple more moderate ones. So in simple terms, for every one pellet that ends up here, hundreds, possibly of thousands of pellets will gravitate towards the, in the middle. Now, a, a good real world example of this would be casino gaming. Um, and essentially, every game in a casino is designed so that the odds of winning favor the house. Um, that is, the games are designed that the winning outcome sits on the tail end of the probability distribution curve, which means that for every one person who wins at a casino, there are literally thousands of people who lose. Also, when an individual does experience a big win or a prolonged hot streak, if they keep on gaming, 
then over time their average win to loss ratio will always regress in favor of the casino. So in terms of risk, what this means is that the law of the regression to the mean states that the longer you play for, the more inevitable it is that the odds will turn and regress. Sorry, the odds will turn and regress back to the mean, um, or the middle of the the probability distribution curve. So now that we understand what a regression to the mean is, we're probably in a good position to talk about regression to the tail and how it impacts on risk. So just as a reminder, um, regression to the tail basically says that the more case examples you throw into a sample population, the more the average or the tail will start trending outwards towards infinity. In fact, what you get is a bit of an elongated tail and it starts to stretch out till eventually you get what's known as a long tail or a fat tail outcome. So regression to the tail is a statistical phenomenon whereby the more case examples added to a sample, the greater the number of extreme outcomes which are experienced. In other words, the tail gets longer. So let's have a look at a couple of uh, real world examples and a good one which is close to my heart is the concept of mega project cost overruns. So mega projects are those big billion dollar plus projects and they have a particularly contentious track record of overrunning on their budgeted costs. In fact, 30 to 50% cost overruns are not uncommon. Uh, we now find that the biggest mega projects are rapidly advancing towards $100 billion, which basically means that cost overruns are now starting to be in the vicinity of $30 billion plus. Now to put that in context, $30 billion represents the market capitalization of an entry level Fortune 500 company. So these are big numbers we're talking about. So what this means is that mega projects are becoming increasingly riskier investments for their owners. Another good example, stock market crashes and the scale of business failures. So uh, a famous case, uh, in 2001, Enron shocked the world by experiencing a bankruptcy in the vicinity of about $65 billion. Now, um, only seven years later, Lehman Brothers beat that with a bankruptcy of roughly $690 billion. So the law of regression to the tail tells us that um, the next record bankruptcy we should expect to experience will probably be in the vicinity of about a trillion dollars. So, you know, that's going to impact tens of thousands of people. So think about that for a while. Another good example, uh, impacts of natural disasters and climate change records, um, you know, such as the hottest day on record, for example. Now, I live in Australia, and I can tell you from personal experience that uh, record bushfires and the hottest day on record seems to be escalating every sort of three to five years on average here, which is kind of scary because, you know, these records can only escalate so much before they become catastrophic to our, our global society. Um, global deaths related to poverty, uh, another concerning one, so people dying from things like malnutrition, disease, corruption, violence, civil war, all of those kind of things. Um, it's estimated, I think, by the IMF that uh, there are roughly 50,000 people dying every single day from uh, poverty-related circumstances worldwide. Now, what the law of regression on the tail suggests is, is that soon more people will die every three months from poverty-related causes than from a full year of coronavirus. So, just something to think about. And then of course, talking about coronavirus, the impact of pandemics. Um, you only had to live through 2020 to see the scale of disruption caused by pandemics. And the reality is that that's not where it's going to end. It's going to get worse with future pandemics because that is what regression to the tail tells us. So by now you're probably saying, well, so what, okay? Well, I think the so what here is, is that the law of regression to the tail tells us that no matter how extreme an event is, there is always going to be another event even more extreme. It's actually only a matter of time. So this means if we don't learn to effectively control risk which regress to the tail now, it's not going to get any easier for us in the future. Now, if we look at the coronavirus phenomenon, um, specifically because it's fresh in our mind, we'll see that as disruptive as coronavirus was, I mean, it's only sitting roughly ninth or 10th in the most fatalistic uh, you know, pandemics of all time. You look at Black Plague, which killed 200 million people, and smallpox, which killed 56 million people. Um, you know, what we have to acknowledge is as disruptive as, as coronavirus was, in time, another pandemic will come along more fatalistic than Black Death and more infectious than smallpox. And that's kind of scary because, um, you know, the way we dealt with coronavirus was that good enough for dealing for a future pandemic that's going to be even more fatalistic and infectious? Now, I don't know, but it is something to think about. So right about now is probably a good time to start talking about, well, how do we effectively control risk which regresses itself? I mean, that's the sum of all our conversations here. What do we do about this? So uh, drawing again from Ben Flyberg and from Nassim Taleb, our mentors on this topic, the first step that they seem to commonly advocate is, is that we need to identify and formally acknowledge the threat of those material risks which have the potential to regress to the tail. And the reason that acknowledges in brackets is because if you look at coronavirus specifically in pandemics, um, we have known for the longest time that a coronavirus-like 
pandemic was coming, but we just didn't acknowledge the threat of it. I mean, pandemics have been part of human history since the very beginning of time. And if you look at the last 30 or 40 years specifically, we've seen a rapid escalation of pandemics from HIV, AIDS, Asian flu, Hong Kong flu, Mars, SIRS, Ebola, swine flu. There were numerous uh, near misses and, and indicators telling us that a COVID type pandemic were coming. Furthermore, there have been numerous risk reports written over the years telling us that uh, infectious diseases and pandemics are a real macro threat that we need to prepare for. I mean, the World Economic Forum has been warning us about this for probably about 15 years now. So it's not that we didn't identify the potential of a, of a pandemic. It's just that we failed to acknowledge the threat and prepare for it. And that's scary. We can't be doing that for other macro threats. So the second point building on the first one is, is that once we've identified and acknowledged the threat, we need to proactively prepare mitigations and monitor for potential escalations. Uh, proactivity pays back a thousandfold um, when facing regression to the tail. And there are a number of reports out there that have been written about the cost of the pandemic, but the one that I particularly like is the World Economic um, Report that you see on your page here, which says that it's going to cost us roughly 500 times more to deal with the aftermath of the pandemic that it would have cost us to prevent or mitigate the pandemic knowing that it was coming. And again, this is scary stuff. There was no excuse for being this unprepared. There was numerous warnings out there and indicators telling us it was coming and we just didn't prepare. Now it's gonna cost us 500 times more. So in future risk step regress to the tail, proactivity is worth its weight in gold. Number three, plan intelligent responses around a number of plausible escalation scenarios. So once we identify what our potential regression threats are, let's prepare for them. Let's have a number of response plans for various types of permutations or escalation scenarios. In particular, what we need to do is have plans for responding immediately to when it escalates to crisis and also cutting off the tail to reduce the systemic spread. Now, if we look at the coronavirus and how we address that, if you remember all those shut, uh, you know, those shutdowns, those lockdowns, the COVID safe behaviors, the social isolation, all of that, um, even flattening of the curve, all of that was designed to cut off the tail and reduce the systemic spread of this pandemic. Um, so this is, is critically important when we face regression risks. And then the fourth one um, is, is one which I think is quite obvious, but it, it's flown a little bit under the, the, the radar uh, in, in recent time because not a lot of people seem to be acknowledging this or talking about this. And it's the concept that after the initial crisis has passed, we need to actively modify, adapt or transfer, uh, transform those relevant systems and behaviors which will allow us to eliminate systemic vulnerability. In other words, improve our overall resilience to future threats. So I think folks, this is an incredibly important one. And we have to acknowledge that the reason that the coronavirus impacted us all so harshly is because our societal existence retained numerous systemic vulnerabilities um, which made us weak in the presence of the virus. So it's not enough to just recover from the initial crisis. We also have to ensure we address those societal vulnerabilities which made us weak in the first place. That is, we have to fix the broken windows, the weak chain links, and those systemic holes and gaps that will allow us to become more resilient to future crises. So I, I see this one as the most important one, but um, you know, you decide for yourself. So I think where we now find ourselves is we actually have an academically validated uh, risk model, if you will, or, or strategy for dealing with risks that regress to the tail. So in terms of a closing thought, um, here's something just to think about. Uh, if we look at our global risk landscape right now, we will notice that many of the documented risks regress to the tail. This means they can escalate incredibly quickly um, and their impacts can compound and grow in a series of ever-increasing ways, exactly what we saw with COVID-19 during 2020. So by now, most people recognize that we should have been better prepared for the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, few people dispute this, but the question now is it's a year later we have an academically endorsed model for controlling future pandemics and other comparable threats, but will we actually take the steps necessary to apply this model so as to ensure we are better prepared for the next escalating macro global threat? And as I've, I've stated repeatedly throughout the series, it's not enough to just recover from the initial crisis. We also have to take proactive steps to ensure we become more resilient to potential future crises. And that's what this model aims to do and what Flyberg and Taleb have been telling us. So I hope you enjoyed this particular episode and you learned something from it. Um, if you did, please look out for some of our previous episodes, which are available on all the usual forums. Um, and also look out for our upcoming episode. Uh, the next one will be um, 
Black Swans, Grey Rhinos and Dragon Kings. I'm looking forward to that and it should be available in a couple of weeks. Um, so until then, thank you very much for your time and uh, by all means, keep safe. Thanks.